Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I am Brian Fisk. I'm Senior Vice President of Research Programs here at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. I'm excited to be moderating our discussion today on a, on a really hot topic about stem cell therapies for Parkinson's disease. Uh, it seems like every other meeting or webinar we host, uh, questions about stem cells come up. Uh, they're always at the top of the list, and so today uh, our goal and hope really is to give you an, a status update and uh, really answer as many questions as we can. So uh, a couple of quick notes before we get started. Um, you are able to submit questions throughout the entire webinar period. So if you look at your screen, you should see a Q&A box kind of near the middle of your screen. Um, type your questions there, and the staff here at the foundation will uh, will work with me to try to try to answer as many of these questions as we can. So if we don't get to all of your questions, um, uh, we do apologize. We'll try to do it at least uh, behind the scenes if we can. Um, I may also occasionally uh, combine questions if I feel like people are asking very similar types of questions. But we'll again try to get through as many as we can. Uh, also, uh, we'll be providing the slides from today's webinar for download, so if you see something and we go through it too quickly, uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, you'll be able to download those slides as well, and you can take another look uh, at your own leisure. All right, so let us get started. Um, so what we are going to cover today um, really is try to uh, have you walk away th with three uh, key messages here. So we're going to talk a little bit about, again, what are stem cells, for those of you who might be a little new to this topic. Um, we're going to, importantly, because I think this is why many of you are here, talk about stem cell therapies for Parkinson's disease and sort of what they are and what they're not. Um, and then we're also going to talk about another use of stem cells that's really important for Parkinson's as well, uh, their use as a research tool. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, of course, at the end, we'll have time for your questions. So uh, fortunately for me and for all of you, uh, I'm joined today really by two excellent panelists. Uh, each are experts in their, in their fields, uh, and they'll be helping me uh, uh, and helping us really understand the state of stem cell science and treatments for Parkinson's disease. So we'll start first with uh, uh, Dr. Claire Hinchcliffe, uh, who is a professor of neurology at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. Uh, and her work focuses on developing and testing stem cell therapies. And so um, uh, we're excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us, Claire. And thanks, Brian. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to be involved in this. Great, great. Uh, we also have Dr. Julia Kay, who's a scientific program leader at the Center for Systems and Therapeutics at Gladstone Institutes in California. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Kay uses stem cells to model brain diseases in the lab with a particular interest in exploring genetic contributors to Parkinson's disease. So thanks for, uh, for uh, calling from the West Coast, uh, Julia. Oh, yes. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Um, all right, so we are going to get started. Um, so our first um, uh, question, really, and concept we want to walk through is, what actually is a stem cell? Uh, because it's really important for us to understand this when we think about therapies and how we use uh, stem cells for research. So I'm going to start with you, Claire, and I wonder if you could walk us sort of briefly through this slide. Again, what are stem cells? You know, what do they normally do, and, and sort of why are they so exciting for, for, for us? Okay, well, this slide is a, a great summary of what a stem cell is. Actually, we kind of talk about these as if they're, they're new things, but um, these have, have uh, really been discussed um, since the early 20th century, and the first time anyone spoke about stem cells was way back in um, 1908. That was uh, Alexander Maximoff who had the idea that um, you could have these cells that would create different, um, different types of cells. He was talking about you know, the different types of cells in the blood. But basically, a, a stem cell is um, it's a single cell and it can either go on and make more of itself so it can replicate itself uh, pretty well indefinitely or it can follow a different pathway um, so stem cells are what we call undifferentiated they don't have the sort of differentiated characteristics that we're used to seeing in um, cells like skin cells or, or blood cells, um, and those are characteristics that uh, uh, make them different from the other cells. So they contribute to their own specific properties that we need. So what this undifferentiated stem cell can do is to turn into these different specific cells. And in the body, we, we've got um, stem cells. I mean, we all, we all develop from a zygote, which is the ultimate stem cell that turns into the embryo. So we all develop from these cells, but um, we have these in our bodies as well. And 
and um, what these cells can do is differentiate into many different uh, cell types. So you can see here examples of nose cells or, or blood cells or pancreas cells or skin cells. So as we have the wear and tear of everyday life and um, you know day-to-day -day living, we have to renew our tissues. And two examples would be in the gut or in the bone marrow, for example, where you've got to make more um, blood cells. And um, these are what the stem cells will do in our daily life. And we do have them in the brain as well. Um, so they're present throughout the body. And I think what makes these so exciting is that in a disorder like Parkinson's disease, um, we as, um, appreciate the possibility uh, that we can derive specific differentiated cells from stem cells that might be able to replenish, repair, um, uh, help regenerate um, some of the cells or um, some of the processes that have been lost in Parkinson's disease. So I think that's what makes stem cells so exciting when we're thinking about developing new treatments for Parkinson's. Right. Thanks. Thanks for for walking us through that. So yeah. So just maybe to carry on that theme, then you know when we think about um, different types of stem cells that are relevant to to uh, thinking about for Parkinson's, we often talk about sort of the different kinds of stem cells and and the different sources of those. Now, I wonder if Claire, if you could kind of continue the conversation, talk about a couple of uh, different approaches here, and I've, I've I've put them up here on the slide. Uh, what are these different types of stem cells, and and and, and how we isolate them? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, really you can divide stem cells, although there are many, many, many different types, but you can divide them into two broad categories. And one of the embryonic stem cells and the others um, which are very exciting are the uh, adult stem cells that we called somatic here. So um, let me just say a couple of words about the embryonic stem cells. I mentioned a minute ago that, you know, the embryo, once you have a a human egg fertilized by a sperm, and it makes um, a, a, a cell called a zygote. So that turns into the embryo. You know, it'll divide into two cells and four cells and eight cells and so on. So um, these are really the ultimate stem cells, if you think about it. You know, we all we de develop from embryos. So everything, every tissue in our body, every cell in our tissues has to derive ultimately from these embryonic stem cells. And so these are um, cells in practice that can be isolated. If we have eggs that are fertilized outside of um, a woman's body, so in in vitro fertilization procedures, um, these can be donated for research with the appropriate consent and screening and so on. And um, these uh, embryos um, can be used to derive embryonic stem cells. So like I mentioned before, you know, these cells are uh, have the capacity to become any cell type in the body. And basically when you get that um, the embryo uh, where you're going to derive the um, embryonic stem cells, you can, you can kind of divide that at four or five days. You can sort of think about it in two parts. And one part is what you call the outer cell mass, you know, and that's going to go on and make the placenta. But the embryonic stem cells actually come from this tiny bundle of cells um, which are undifferentiated, and that's called the inner cell mass. And that's going to be responsible for um, generating uh, any particular cell that you could think of in the human body. So those are the embryonic stem cells. And then what's um, uh, really um, you know, made advances in leaps and bounds over the, the past few years is the technology um, to use and investigate the adult stem cells. So I mentioned before that um, you know, wear and tear in everyday life means that you've got to be able to regenerate some cells. So that's how, for example, if you have a, a cut in your skin, you would heal that wound. Um, this is uh, because your adult stem cells get activated. So these cells, you find them among um, specialized cells in different body tissues and organs. So they're in the skin, they're in the blood, they're in the liver, really throughout the body. Now these are um, typically more restricted than the embryonic stem cells. So uh, for example, the stem cells that are sitting in your skin, they're not going to be able to create brain cells sitting in your skin. So these really um, can differentiate only into cell types uh, that are appropriate to their location. So they're going to, uh, a stem cell sitting in your skin is going to develop into different uh, skin cells and cells that are, are found in the skin. So they really will turn into cell types of the tissue or organ um, where they're found.
Great, thanks. So uh, you kind of alluded to this, and I'll, I'll switch to the next slide here, and maybe actually ask uh, Julia to kind of walk us through this. But this idea, this kind of exciting technology, where you know the first two cell types you mentioned, obviously, were, were things that we, you know, kind of can isolate from from the body. But we've also come up with ways to kind of create stem cells, basically, in the laboratory. And so, so Julia, could you walk us through this? What what are these types of cells? Sure, yeah. So um, a little over about 10 years ago, um, a couple of investigators, um, Jamie Thompson and Chinya Yakima, um, they basically um, were really interested in finding um, sets of genes that can um, essentially turn a, a, a differentiated cell, so a cell that's very specialized, like a skin cell or a heart cell, um, if they, they, they were interested in finding a way to basically take, um, re revert that cell back into a so-called embryonic stem cell-like state. And so what they did is they screened through lots of genes. So it turns out the genes, so the genes that kind of comprise um, <laughs> our, uh, our makeup, um, and different genes are expressed in different cell types. And so um, the panel of genes that's expressed, for example, in the heart is really different than the panel of genes that are expressed in the, in the brain. And so um, there's also a whole other set of genes that's expressed um, that basically um, tells those cells to not become specialized. And so what they did is they found uh, those genes, and um, they um, now really developed this amazing technology, which I think has really revolutionized um, the way uh, we can go about studying disease. Because what we can do is we can take um, fully differentiated cells and introduce these, we call them so-called reprogramming factors, or their, their genes, essentially. And what, they, what these genes do is they, they go into the cell and they say, OK, um, all of the specialized gene, uh, gene expression needs to be basically turned down. And then we're going to turn up the gene expression or the genes that are important for pluripotency or important for um, you know, cell division and um, uh, yeah, basically all the characteristics that, that Claire described that make a so-called embryonic stem cell that can become any cell in the body. So then um, what we can do is we can, wait, uh, we can introduce these factors and we wait some time and then we make um, this really amazing uh, renewable uh, source of cells. These are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And these can be grown and propagated pretty much indefinitely in the lab. But what's really um, exciting about this is that then we can take um, these cells and we can really um, we can add certain factors which really push them or start to make them into specific cell types. And so we can make them into blood or brain uh, cells. Um, and so for Parkinson's disease, this is what's mo really exciting because uh, we can make the specific cell type that's most affected in, in PD. Um, and then we can study them in a lab. Great, great. Yeah, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about that and some of the work that you do in, in that space later on in the webinar today. But, but yeah, really a powerful new technique, and I think one that's really revolutionized the, the not just in Parkinson's, but I think uh, our understanding of a lot of different diseases. All right, so moving on. Um, so we talked a little bit about what stem cells are and some of the different types of stem cells, but you know, how are we actually using these? And, and again, this will be sort of what we'll spend the rest of the, the webinar really talking about. And you know, when we think about the different types of stem cells, uh, you know, scientists can use them really for a variety of things. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, here in a moment about obviously the ways we could use them for treatments. And, and, and when we think about sort of the uses of stem cells, uh, you know, we often think about uh, stem cells really is either sources for making new or replacement cells and tissues, um, but also stem cells spit out a lot of different factors. And so some people have been using actually the, the concept of, of stem cells to, to, to as really as ways to almost provide supportive factors for other cells in the body and, and other injured cells. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that particular concept because I think that the field there is a little a, a little more um, um, uh, more difficult to sort of talk about. But I uh, did want to at least mention that, that there are some uh, efforts and approaches looking at ways of using stem cells almost as as sort of vehicles for, for protective factors that could help other cells. Uh, but again, that at the end, we'll talk a lot about, and Julia will walk us through this, about some of the ways we use, again, stem cells for research purposes, for understanding Parkinson's and, and trying to find new treatments uh, 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 through our understanding.
All right, so moving on, uh, we're going to start with therapies, and I know that's really why a lot of people are on the call today, so we're going to spend a, a few minutes really talking through this, and I'm going to ask Claire to help me uh, here, obviously, and uh, really just think about, you know, what are, what are some of the basic concepts here, Claire, about, you know, how we can think about using stem cells uh, uh, for therapies for Parkinson's, and, and probably touch a little bit on, you know, what do we think they can help with, but also what do we think they probably are not going to be able to help with in the context of Parkinson's disease. So, so if you could you walk us through this? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Brian. So, um, and, and thanks for that great uh, introduction. You brought up a lot of important points there. Um, so I think, like Brian was saying, uh, that the major thrust so far of stem cell-based therapies in Parkinson's disease is really to look at uh, replacing the dopamine cells that are, are lost. And there's a great history of trying to do this. We're not the, the first um, teams, the first scientists, the first researchers who are trying to take this approach. So if you think about it, you know, even back in the 1980s, um, researchers were looking for sources of cells that might be um, appropriate for transplant into the brain where they could replenish the dopamine inputs that Parkinson's has taken away. And, you know, people had looked at um, uh, cells from the adrenal gland, for example, or cells from what's called the carotid body. But I think the richest history has been looking at um, taking human embryonic cells. And uh, there's been some encouragement from that field. But what we have the possibility to do now is... Um, as Julia was just explaining, you can take uh, stem cells, either human embryonic stem cells, or you can take the IPS, um, the induced pluripotent cells, and start to develop cells. You can coax them along this pathway to become dopamine cells, or junior versions, um, adolescent versions, if you like, of dopamine cells. And unlike any of the cell sources that we've had available in the past, um, when you develop these cells from stem cells, you've really got yourself a source that is very reliable. Um, you can monitor the purity. You can make sure that these cells function well when you're doing the preclinical um, testing. Uh, you can make sure that they're making dopamine. You can characterize them in any which way that you care to do so. Um, so one thing I want to say just before I go through the rest of the slide is that when we're talking about stem cell-derived therapies, I just want to make sure that people understand we're not talking about transplanting the stem cells themselves because like you said before, you know, these stem cells cells can make any type of cell. So you don't want to put stem cells in that could make um, hair or skin or liver or, or potentially tumors. That's a really scary one. So actually what people are, are looking at is producing dopamine cells from these embryonic stem cells or the iPS cells and using those to implant in, into the brain. And the concept is um, pretty straightforward. We've lost dopamine implants into a part of the brain called the putamen, which is deep down uh, on each side within each hemisphere. And when you don't have sufficient dopamine inputs there, that really um, can wreak havoc with uh, movement and controlling coordination. And so the idea is very basic, that implanting these um, replacement, if you like, dopamine cells or dopamine cell uh, precursors, the juvenile forms, um, would be a substitute for the cell inputs that are lost. So that's the, um, as Brian said, that, that's the rationale that most people are following. And, and so th this is really what I'm going to talk about in um, more global approaches that would look at other parts of the brain. I'm not going to talk so much about. So if you think about it, if what you're doing is to replace dopamine inputs, it kind of follows from there. What, what would you expel, expect? this to help with. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with taking levodopa or, um, you know, taking dopamine agonists or any of the other Parkinson's medicines to help the symptoms of movement, these are the sorts of things that we're looking for these cells to help with. So we'd be looking at, for example, muscle stiffness and slowing and coordination. We'd be looking for the cells to help all of those things and the tremor. So basically, if you boil it down, I, I, I don't want to it's probably not quite this simple, but if you think about it, anything that levodopa could do or anything that the dopamine agonists are doing, then you could expect these cells to do. Now, that's great, and I think that would be a, a, huge, um, a, a huge advance, and it, these 
this would be conceptualized as a, a single time surgery and if you could get over the movement problems with that it would be amazing um, but let me just come back to what Brian mentioned as well it doesn't take care of everything these uh, cells as we see them right now are not going to be a magic bullet the Parkinson's is still going to progress and, and I think as everyone knows it's not just the dopamine cells that are affected in Parkinson's so we've got serotonin cells we've got cells producing acetone Choline. Um, so you've got all of these other symptoms that may not be helped by this um, approach of replacing the dopamine cells. So for example, if you think about um, memory problems, thought processing problems, problems with executive function, you know, multitasking, maybe things like that, we, we um, might not expect this sort of approach to uh, work with. But still, I think that um, in uh, as, as researchers and as clinicians, we still think that if we could alleviate the burden on people with Parkinson's of the motor, then we may be able to um, uh, uh, really help people's quality of life. So um, the, there is a richness of uh, this type of approach from um, using embryonic cells from humans before. And um, it's true that the studies have shown inconclusive results overall. But I would say that some of the patients who've participated got some benefits. Um, some did not get benefit. Um, we know that the cells survive because uh, scans, for example, PET scans like fluorodopa PET scans could show that the cells survive. And then the question is, you, can the stem cell therapies um, that have uh, what we think is a superior um, type of cell to work with to the old cell types, could these really advance and give us better results than what's been seen before and overcome some of the variability? So we do think that we've got better cell products to work with. Um, the uh, past studies have helped us to solve how to get the cells where we want them to be. And we think that um, we also understand a lot better about what to test for and what should improve and um, what are some of the strategies for following patients in the clinical trials. So I think this, um, it's, there's a rich history here, but we've got, uh, with new advances in stem cells, um, we have much superior types of cell products to work with than we've ever had before, and I think that's the reason for the excitement. Great, great. So why don't we move on, actually, and just, like, what does, you know, what does the current sort of therapeutic pipeline actually look like for Parkinson's and sort of stem cell-based therapies? And moving to this slide here, and we, we, we try to put down some of the, uh, you know, current trials that are at least publicly out there um, in, when we look at sort of the, the clinical trial databases um, and the different approaches that are, are currently being tested in the clinic in Parkinson's disease. And, and, and I was going to have you, Claire, maybe just walk us through the different sort of approaches that are, that are currently being used. Um, and, and maybe just talk a little bit about generally about what you think the pipeline looks like, maybe even some of the, the, the types of approaches you think are, are getting close to the clinic. Yeah, absolutely. And and this is um this is a really great slide. Um I think that rather than attempt to list every single uh, clinical trial that's out there and every single clinical trial that's upcoming, um there are four clinical trials here that really illustrate very nicely the diversity of the types of cells that are being investigated for this sort of approach. So um what these four uh, clinical trials have in common is that everyone is trying to use um, the cells, the stem cells, as a source of producing uh, dopamine progenitors, um, dopamine cells that can then be transplanted into the brain or um, the stem cells themselves are already on the pathway they, where they can produce these dopamine cells. So all of these trials are aiming to replenish, um, replace the dopamine inputs that have been lost. So none of them are really looking outside of that. But um, just very briefly to walk you through the um, ISCO, ISCO, the International Stem Cell Corporation, um, are running a trial with um, a sort of cell that is called parthenogenetic. And we didn't talk about this before, but what they've done is um, develop cells from unfertilized eggs by manipulating them. 
And so these are a little bit different to some of the other stem cells that are out there. Um, Celavi Biosciences are taking a different approach, and they're using um, human neural progenitor cells. So these are progenitors um, that have been ex uh, extracted. These are embryonic, human embryonic in origin. Um, one of the uh, studies that I think everyone's eyes are on right now is the Transuro study, and um, this is led by Roger Barker in Europe. Um, and I mentioned already that there's a, a very rich history of looking at um, whether embryonic tissue as a source uh, could help people with Parkinson's if transplanted. And the whole idea is that the tiny little fragments of tissue or these uh, cells that are transplanted contain dopamine neuron progenitors. So they pre contain the precursors. And so uh, what the Transuro study is doing is um, basically learning from what's been done in the past and they've optimized their clinical trial design very nicely, and they are um, repeating the studies, uh, but in an optimized clinical trial design using human embryonic tissue. So we're, we're waiting on the results from that. They won't be out until uh, 2021, although there, there was just a, a paper published with um, a sort of update on the uh, clinical trial design and what the rest of us are able to take away from that. And then another um, study, which I think is just incredibly exciting and, and incredibly innovative. And this is really bouncing off the, um, the technological platform that Julia was talking about a few minutes ago and using um, iPS cells. So these are induced pluripotent cells. They've been um, derived from adult cells, and just like Julia explained, they've been um, manipulated to become pluripotent stem cells, and then kind of coaxed in the laboratory to become dopamine progenitors. And I think everyone is, is watching this. Um, there was a press release uh, in um, uh, late last year. Um, we know that uh, one patient has had unilateral transplantation of these cells, and uh, so far so good, not hearing about any complications. We don't have um, the results uh, that would help us understand whether this is working, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is when we're looking at the timeline for this sort of trial and the ones that are coming up, um, I think in the short term, People are very interested, obviously, to make sure that these are safe and that they're tolerable, that people are not getting too many um, side effects from these cell transplantations. And some of them, um, bear in mind, uh, a lot of these clinical trials are um, also use, giving immunosuppressive agents, so medications to um, prevent any kind of reaction against the cell. So the first thing with these um, uh, studies is really to make sure that they're safe, that they're tolerable. And then um, the next thing is, when are we going to start to see whether there's actually some beneficial effects? And we know from previous studies with the embryonic stem cells that have been done that sometimes you, you don't see these effects straight away. And probably, you know, the cells need to mature and they need to make the right connections. And then the host cells are, are going to make connections onto them. So we may not expect to see um, effects straight away. It could take a year or two years or, or three years or a little longer. So um, this is, uh, it requires some patience to see exactly what these cells can do. And of course, it's going to be important to see the long-term follow-up. Um, so those are four great examples with four very different tissues uh, or cells sources. And then I just wanted to mention that um, one example that's not in here because these are not ongoing yet is um, going back to, you remember we talked about the human embryonic stem cells right at the beginning. And those are cells that are, um, they come out of that inner cell mass in the very early embryo called the blastocyst stage. And there are um, multiple groups now who have managed to, again, coax those embryonic stem cells to become juvenile versions, uh, progenitor versions of the uh, dopamine cells that are lost in Parkinson's. And our, our group is, is one of the groups who are taking this approach, and there are other groups um, across the U.S. and across the, the world, including in Europe and including Roger Barker's group. Um, well, he's, he was the one I mentioned with TransEuro. So I think we're going to be seeing um, several uh, clinical trials um, starting up within the next couple of years. So it's an incredibly exciting time. 
Um, and uh, it's, it's also good to see that people are using different types of stem cells because um, although we obviously all think that we're taking the, uh, the best approach, um, no one group knows that their particular cells are going to be the best. So I think to have this multiplicity of approaches at this point seems very appropriate and good for the field. Great. Yeah, no, thank you for walking us through that. Um, so, uh, obviously, one aspect of stem cell treatments, I think, is, and it's sort of almost unique a little bit to this type of therapy, is, you know, some of the challenges, I think, uh, you know, for the community to understand kind of what's what are real treatments versus what are maybe um, treatments that are, are, are being uh, offered directly to, to the patient community that may not be necessarily as regulated or, or, or definitely much more sort of exploratory and unproven. And, and I think this has become a, a growing issue in the, in the last few years, and even the FDA has now had to sort of step in more specifically. And there's an example here on this slide of a, of a, a recent statement they had to actually uh, 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 put a permanent injunction on a, on a group that was, was delivering these types of therapies. And uh, Claire, again, could you walk us through what are some of the concerns here? And, and maybe even you could even talk a little bit about your own experience just with, with your own, uh, the patients that you see uh, who maybe uh, are looking into this type of approach. You know, why do we need to be worried and concerned about some of these uh, uh, approaches that are being offered? Yeah, thanks, Brian. This is um, a really tough area, actually. So I think what we've talked about so far are the really scientifically sound um, uh, projects that are going on, you know, that are just backed up by years and years and in some cases decades of preclinical work and, and very um, extremely careful and extremely slow work on trying to get the right cells and figuring out who are going to be the, the people who can benefit and exactly what can these cells do. And like you were brought up before, it's important to think about what they can't do. Um, so we've got that on the one extreme. And then, if you like, on the other extreme, um, we've got uh, clinics who offer um, what they're calling stem cell treatments. And these may be, you know, the adult stem cells that are sitting there in people's belly fat or um, they're present in, in the blood. And um, it's correct that there are stem cells within those tissues, but I think that some clinics are um, offering uh, what they're marketing as treatments to patients really without having had um, any careful characterization of what their cells are doing and um, you know so when you see a clinic and everything that they're saying that's good is based on patient testimonials and you really can't figure out um, uh, what the details are I think that's fairly clear on the other end that that, that may be a place where uh, you don't want to get involved and then I think there's a whole gray area in the middle so um, we said for, for this um, webinar we were going to focus on the human embryonic stem cells and the um, iPS cells, but of course there's this um, area of what they call mesenchymal stem cells, and these are adult stem cells. You, you can get them out of the blood, uh, for example, and there are actually some um, very uh, well-respected groups who have started to look at whether these can be used for Parkinson's or, or um, sometimes Parkinson's Plus, for example. And they're starting to understand a little bit how these cells might work. So um, for cells like that, I would say that it, it really becomes an area where you, you want to get educated and find out what these people are doing because there's some very uh, highly respected groups who are studying those cells, trying to figure out how they work. They're, they're publishing their results. Um, for example, a group who published um, use of mesenchymal stem cells in multiple, um, in multiple system atrophy earlier this year, and they went really into the details of what were some of the complications and what they thought might be some benefits. Um, and then there are other groups where, again, they're using these types of cells um, that may have some science behind them, but the way that they're being used is promoting um, hopes for probably uh, what are unreasonable outcomes. Um, I would say in, in my experience, I really encourage my patients, if, they, if they're looking at um, therapeutics that are a little bit outside the box. It could be this, it could be any one of a number of other therapeutics. Um, I really encourage them to come and talk to me about it. And uh, sometimes it, it really means that I have to do a little bit of extra legwork and, you know, go look up references. Um, even uh, sometimes talk to the, the people who are involved and um, try to see what they're doing. Um, but this is, this is a, a tough one. And I would say 
you know, for anyone who's got Parkinson's who's thinking about this kind of thing, make sure you understand what's going on. Get as get as much information as you can. Get educated, and um, discuss it with your dog. Right, right, right. And I, you know, my understanding too here is, that, you know, there are real concerns. So it could either be side effects, sort of un, unexpected side effects of these types of approaches, but also there have actually been people who've been sort of harmed and, and injured with, again, some of these um, um, unproven approaches. That, that's exactly right, and 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 actually, just um, uh, yesterday, I was looking at a paper that was published in in the New England Journal, and this was um, you know a mass that that someone unfortunately developed in their spinal cord, and and you know this um, this uh, poor patient uh, was was a victim of the stem cell tourism, and and um, so. Uh, yeah, this can be this can be serious stuff. Um, you know, you, you, uh, th these these complications can include tumors, can involve uh, damage and, and harm. Um, so these are uh, these are not benign procedures. Right, right. Okay, um, so I'm going to move us along, and we're going to switch gears here now and actually talk about a different way of using stem cells that I think is also critically important. And so, Julia, I, I know this is the, the area that you work in, and you know, uh, you sort of told us before about some of the new technologies for, for making stem cells. Uh, talk a little bit more de in detail about that. How are you actually using these to understand Parkinson's disease? <clears throat> Yeah, so the idea here is that um, we can take these um, cells, we make them into these uh, cells from patients, and we make them into induced pluripotent stem cells. And then we can, um, as I said before, we can add specific factors that make them into the specific cell type that's most affected in the disease. So in the case of Parkinson's disease, where um, people are really interested in making dopaminergic neurons, um, and so actually here this is a, an image we, um, of uh, cells that have been differentiated into cells that express some of the genes that we think are um, are expressed by dopaminergic neurons um, in the brain. And so the idea, and what's really exciting is that we can essentially develop a platform. It's really a research-based platform where we can go in the laboratory and then um, ask questions about, for example, if there's different genes um, that may uh, um, uh, change the fate of these cells. Um, so these cells, again, they come directly from the patient. We can develop them into the specific cell type that's most affected um, in Parkinson's disease, and then we, um, we can either add small molecules or we can ch change gene expression. We can um, assay different, um, di different um, uh, methods, really, to see if we can change the fate these cells, if we can make them healthier, for example, or um, if some of the, the pathologies that we observe in these cells can be restored um, by some of, um, by, by various treatments. Great, great, great. So um, I want to then now move on to, I think, what everybody's probably excited to, to be able to do is start hearing questions and, 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 and answering them from our attendees. And so um, as we've been talking, uh, we've been getting a lot of interesting questions come through the through the uh, uh, chat chat group. And so I want to try to start with a few that have popped up, and we'll touch on some of the themes that, that we've been talking about. Um, and I, some of these come back to, again, the idea of the stem cells as treatments. And we had a lot of questions as we were going through that that section about, again, kind of back to this idea of you know, who might be most appropriate for stem cell approaches? Are there any sort of considerations? We had a few people ask, you know, if, if you've had DBS surgery, does that mean you can't be a candidate for a stem cell approach in the future? And, and Claire, I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about some of that, again, and really in the context of kind of who would be most appropriate for a stem cell type treatment. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about that in, in our group, and I know with other groups as well, because as we're designing these um, first clinical trials, you, you have to think about, well, who stands to benefit? Um, so uh, it, it really goes back to what we were talking about a bit before, what what can these cells do? And I, I said maybe a little simplistically, well, these, these cells can do what levodopa can do, but I think if you think about having the cells um, sitting in the putamen and, and 
um, delivering dopamine in a, a fairly natural, fairly physiologic way, uh, not completely, but fairly, um, then it really means that, for example, people who respond to levodopa, but the levodopa wears off, you know, people with what we call the, the mode of fluctuations where the carbidopa levodopa may cut out on them, the, they, they get wearing off, the Parkinson's symptoms come back. You would think that that would be a really great place where the cells could be helpful because the cells are sitting there and they're just delivering the dopamine. It's not coming and going. It uh, really should be a good, nice, steady delivery. So when we were thinking about it, we thought, okay, you know, it's, it's people who respond to levodopa. So we know, we know they're responsive to dopamine itself coming from the levodopa, but where the oral delivery of levod levodopa just isn't um, holding them. So um, we think to begin with, that's a, a good place to start in people who are a little bit further along with the, the Parkinson's, um, not early where they're, uh, you know, um, doing very well with the medicines. And who knows, we may be having this discussion in 10 years' time and we'll be saying, well, how early should we go in Parkinson's? Because if you um, think theoretically about it, if this does turn out to be an efficacious, safe, and tolerable treatment, then why wouldn't you just start this early? And um, it, particularly where you've got younger people who we know that they're going to be more vulnerable to um, the complications of levodopa down the line with wearing off and with dyskinesia, why wouldn't we be thinking about them? But um, as things stand right now, I think that we, uh, aside from the levodopa response, which we're all thinking is going to be a good predictor of who may benefit benefit from the um, from the cells but we have to think about people's age for example and um, I mentioned before that I, the vast majority of the studies to begin with are going to be giving immunosuppressive drugs and we know that um, older people unfortunately get more side effects from from that so we have to think about um, uh, having an age cut off um, the stage of Parkinson's I, I mentioned um, we think that people could benefit where they're in a stage of Parkinson's where they may be fluctuating. But if someone has had Parkinson's for many, many years and then is starting to have problems that we don't think the cells are going to be helpful for, like, unfortunately, dementia, for example, or if someone's having terrible problems with their, their blood pressure and fainting all the time, um, anything that's not coming from the um, dopamine part of Parkinson's, then maybe we have to think about that. And so, you know, unfortunately, people people who um, have dementia from their Parkinson's probably shouldn't get this. Um, and then we have to think about uh, the level of um, general health. And I think in these uh, first studies, again, we're in a situation where we're primarily going to be looking for safety and tolerability. Um, and we're looking to follow people for, uh, for the long run, and we're looking to give at least short-term immunosuppressants. And so, um, People who, who are in good general health, I think, are going to be more likely the participants in these early studies. And then a great question about deep brain stimulation. The um, studies, uh, first in human studies and the early studies like TransEuro, um, in general, these are not going to be taking people who already have deep brain stimulation. Um, and I think that would uh, partly, there's a scientific reason for that. It's going to complicate the outcomes. Um, but also, I think that once you've had one surgery, when we're um, thinking about something that's very novel, probably the best thing is um, to deliver the cells into people who have not already had a previous surgery. But down the line, you can imagine a lot of different scenarios, and maybe people are going to be getting these in combination, or maybe testing is going to be done versus deep brain stimulation. So I think right now I would say if you've had DBS, it's very unlikely um, that you uh, get into these studies, but I think down the line um, that's probably going to change. Sort of a, maybe a follow-up question to that, and a few people have alluded to this as well. Sort of, you know, that we talked about it earlier. This concept that, you know, uh, at least in the 
current sort of vision of how stem cells could be used in Parkinson's as sort of replacement cells and things like that, but that the underlying disease process is going to continue you know, as far as the, 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 the effects that are happening in, in the brains of people with Parkinson's. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I know there has been some evidence to suggest some of that disease process could even potentially sort of um, um, spill over into replacement cells and sort of what some of your thinking around that and are there are, are sort of researchers in this space thinking about ways to address that in the future? Um, yeah, I, I think that's really a um, fantastic question. It, this, this, is, this is all to answer. Um, this is all, all, uh, uh, these are all questions that we have to look at. But I think what we can say from um, the previous studies where they've used human embryonic uh, cells for transplantation, um, there, there is evidence that, uh, you know, this so-called pathological hallmark of Parkinson's, um, which are the Lewy bodies, you know, these little protein blobs that we see in the nerve cells in Parkinson's. Um, you see those in, in, the, uh, in the brain of people with Parkinson's, and um, they have also been seen in the cells that have pe been put in in the grafts. I think it's, you know, scientists are still working out exactly how that spread occurs, and I think we have a little way to go in terms of figuring out different vulnerabilities of the cells. I mean, we're putting in cells that are um, actually quite quite young. Um, and in Parkinson's, there's a definite effect of aging. So we may not see, um, uh, although there may be spread, there may not be significant spread. And I would say in the autopsy studies where, we, we, where people have died of other causes and we, um, scientists have been able to look at the engrafted cells in there, um, they can see that the pathology, the process, the Parkinson's process has spread, but I would say it's um, uh, to a, a, a more minor extent, and we don't know that that's actually had any clinical effect on the people um, where that's been documented. Um, I think down the line, it's going to be really interesting to see if we can, first of all, pin down how important that is. Second of all, it's going to be important to see, as we're talking, starting to talk about people maybe getting their own cells transplanted, and um, Julia might be able to speak a little bit more to that, but um, if they're getting their own cells transplanted, might they be more vulnerable? Are there some people where they should not have their own cells transplanted? Are there others where it would be perfectly fine? So I, I think we have to pin that down. And um, whether we could come up with some ways of being able to, perhaps through a sort of combination therapy, um, be able to prevent spread and prevent, you know, this transmission of misfolded alpha-synuclein from the, the quote, host tissue into the transplanted tissue. Um, I think these are all questions that, that, that people are um, looking at right now. Uh, so we don't have answers yet, but um, it's a watch this space, I think. Right, right. Actually, so you raised some interesting points. I was going to maybe flip to Julia and talk about a couple of things too. Some of the some of the theme of some of the questions that are popping through, kind of in this broad context of again who might be most appropriate. But uh, you know, uh, and again, thinking about use of stem cells from people with Parkinson's to, again to understand disease. And you know, what, what, what Julia, what are you are you, what are you seeing? Maybe some more recently things we're learning about again Parkinson's through these types of approaches and and how that's maybe helping us understand I think an important question in the field which is the different types of Parkinson's disease out that might be out there that might be related to different types of say genetic causes and I wonder if you could just maybe comment a little bit more on kind of generally what we're learning as we are uh, looking at these uh, different types of stem cells. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, early on, I think there was a lot of questions of, well, you know, so there's different genetic backgrounds um, or different uh, mutations or variants that cause Parkinson's disease, and I think there was a lot of questions, well, if we, um, you know, if we take these cells, can we actually see any differences um, in, the patho in their pathology um, in the laboratory setting? And it turns out, in fact, uh, we really do. In fact, certain um, so there's different mutations in alpha synuclein and LARC2, um, PINK1, PARKIN, and like, and that those mutations, um, in the, in the ways that we think that they're altering the cell in certain functions, for example, in mitochondria or um, one big theme 
not just in Parkinson's disease, but in actually a lot of uh, neurodegenerative disorders is, is sort of protein clearance or how the cell um, kind of gets rid of unwanted um, or toxic proteins or misfolded proteins. Um, so it turns out that a lot of um, the, the, the pathways, if you will, the cellular pathways that, um, that we've you know, sort of have been hinted at by, um, that have been um, affected in the disease, um, in fact, uh, show something called phenotypes. So they show um, these um, basically problems with these cells um, uh, in culture. And so that's, that's quite promising because it suggests that if we can capture, um, if we can understand, um, you know, kind of what the different pathologies are that are caused by different variants or mutations, um, that we know are associated with Parkinson's disease um, that will help us basically um, better understand the cellular pathways um, and then also um, potentially ways in which we can sort of get in there and, and, and tweak those, those, um, those pathways or, or per perhaps help, help the cell do better or, um, or for example, to, you know, turn over the um, mitochondria uh, better than, uh, or similar to healthy cells. Uh, when we were preparing for the webinar, uh, webinar you and I, I, I think we had a, a brief conversation about an, in, an interesting idea that I've, I've always been really fascinated by, which is this concept of, you know, as you obviously learn more about the biology of stem cells, in many ways you're kind of learning more about the biology of cell development, so how a cell can go from essentially a single cell, an embryonic cell, to, you know, make any cell type in the body and and sort of leveraging that knowledge to identify mechanisms in, say, the brain where you might be able to go in and target that mechanism and actually have the brain sort of repair itself. And, and I don't know if, 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 I know this is sort of a fascinating idea and, <laughs> and there hasn't been a lot of therapeutic development in that space yet, to, at least to my knowledge. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that concept. It feels a little sci-fi maybe, but this idea that yeah. you actually tar learn something from these cells to target in the brain. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question, um, and I think one that uh, us as biologists, especially developmental biologists um, in the lab, I think we, you know, we're still really, I'd say, struggling with trying to understand, right, so development is this very, you know, human development or, uh, is this very complex process of, you know, cells talking to each other, and there's changes in gene expression, and it's this complex sort of communication or circuitry that really, um, you know, tells cells, okay, you know, you're going to become a, a, a neuron and I'm going to become an astrocyte. And so this sort of um, back and forth, I think, we don't really understand yet. We're uh, it's still very early days, but by, but by um, growing these cells um, in the lab, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot of effort, there's been a tremendous amount of effort of trying to understand essentially um, what uh, molecules or what genes that may better push these cells to, towards a specific cell type fate. So in our case, we're really interested in dopaminergic neurons. Um, so the more we understand what those um, molecules are, those genes are that can really push that cell to become a specialized cell, that opens up, I think, a, a very large um, really field of study to help us potentially um, harness those same you know, genes um, or ways of turning on those genes that we could we could do the same in the brain, right? So if if you've lost um, you know a, a lot of your dopaminergic neurons, well, one idea would be you know rather than for example replacing them, which I think is is, is a very exciting uh, pro, uh, prospect, and one I think that I'm, I think you know we'll, we'll see how um, in the next uh, few years how with the clinical trials, but, but the other idea would be to just um, be able to harness the, um, the, you know, the brain itself to say, okay, if we can target um, uh, these, these specific genes and turn them on, we can basically um, uh, essentially re have, this, have the brain replace the cells it needs, and so that's kind of the idea. I, again, I think it's very far out there, but I think it's a very um, potentially exciting approach uh, that, that could come to fruition. <laughs> the, more, the more that we understand yeah. about really development of, of how these cells are generated and how they're made. Right, right. And I, I, my graduate work was in, in brain development, and so I think even back then I was pretty fascinated by that concept as well and, and, uh, and look forward to continued progress in, on that idea. Um, another reason I think of why I asked the question, you know, we've had a lot of questions from, from, from the attendees, you know, kind of in this broad theme again of, of, of stem cell replacement type therapies and, and how they are currently delivered. And, 
and again, Claire, maybe just to kind of kind of reemphasize and walk us back through on sort of the different approaches, and that the majority of them, again, I think to my knowledge, all involve brain surgery and sort of placement of cells into the brain. And maybe again, talk a little bit about the actual procedure itself. Like, what's the surgery involved in this type? These types. Yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I, I was thinking that uh, we needed to get into a bit of speci uh, a bit more of the specifics about that. Um, all of the approaches that I've, I've talked about, you know, the, the examples of the um, trials that you saw on the previous slide, uh, what we're planning to do, what other groups are, are planning to do with the replacement, I, I think I said rather glibly, oh, we, we want to get the cells into the putamen, um, it's deep down in the brain, obviously, it needs a um, it needs a, a surgery. And so um, the surgical delivery of the cells um, needs uh, someone to be right now, um, the way that it's done needs a general anesthesia. It goes back to a little bit of this, uh, what I was saying about you need to be in, in pretty good, you know, good health uh, for this sort of thing. So it's a general anesthesia. Um, it's uh, making little burr holes in the, in the skull so that you can thread um, a cannula. So if you think about the deep brain stimulation surgery, similar principle, right? But instead of threading in an electrode in this um, way, you're threading in a needle, a cannula. Uh, um, once you're where you need to be in the putamen, and different people are going to do this in, in very slightly different ways, then the cells get injected. Um, the needle can be moved, the cells injected again. So you want to get quite good coverage of the area where you're trying to deliver your cells. You don't want to end up with um, just a, a few hot spots that might uh, overly help one thing and, and not help um, other features. Uh, so it's going to be um, a quite, uh, you know, a, a surgery that demands a lot of precision in the way that the cells are delivered. I think we have really fantastic technologies now. For example, here um, we have an MRI that's in the operating room, so you can actually follow at intervals what's going on. Um, and uh, the, the technology for the surgery is being developed all the time. Um, I think I would just say that uh, we've learned a lot. We're standing on the shoulders of giants with this surgery. Um, you know, the deep brain stimulation field has obviously worked very hard to figure out the best ways of doing these surgeries. And now we have people who have pioneered uh, gene therapy and are also looking at um, different ways of doing the surgery. So I think we're, we're all watching these fields, um, see other ways to improve. But yeah, uh, it needs a surgery. And then um, after the, the surgery, is completed, um, like I mentioned before, you're not done then because most groups are, are going to give probably some months or, or a year or maybe more of immunosuppressive drugs. Right, right. And now I know that some of the um, uh, treatments that are being offered directly to patients out there uh, involve uh, uh, approaches that are more injecting cells into the bloodstream, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so um, everything that we've talked about for the dopamine cell replacement will need the sort of surgery that I described, at least with the current technologies. So when you read about um, cell deliveries, of, for example, these mesenchymal cells that are your own cells and they come from your blood or from the belly fat, um, and that can be uh, injected into the veins. Um, there are also instances where it's been injected into the spinal fluid, but I think a lot of the clinics are injecting into the veins. It's, um, it's really a completely different principle. Um, the cells are, are not really expected to get up to the brain and get to the right spot and survive and make dopamine neurons. So it's a very different principle. And I think that the, um, like I mentioned before, there are some teams who are doing really fantastic work with this sort of approach. And I mentioned a paper in um, multiple system atrophy. And the idea is that these cells would work in a different way. They, they probably 
um, if they have effects, they would have effects by secreting factors. There's this concept of something called the secretome, and it means if you're a cell, all of the different factors that you're releasing, and some of those can be anti-inflammatory, or some may prevent cell death. Um, so the, these are these are some of the mechanisms that are being investigated. But um, thanks for bringing that up, Brian, because I, I don't want people to think that um, uh, getting an injection into the bloodstream. Um, is going to get the cells up to your brain and, and replace the uh, dopamine cells that have been lost. Okay. Well, so we are really almost at the end of the hour. I'm always surprised how quickly these webinars go, and I know we could probably spend the next three or four hours answering everybody's questions. But I do hope we were able to at least capture the, uh, as many of the theme of the questions as we could. So apologies to those who, if we didn't get directly to your specific question, um, our team here at the, at the foundation will, will kind of go through those questions. And if, if there's any way we can send you additional information that could help address your question, we'll, we'll do our best to do that. But um, uh, I did want to thank our panelists, uh, Claire and Julia. I know you're you're both busy, uh, busy day jobs, uh, working hard, trying to understand and find new ways to treat Parkinson's. And so we obviously uh, appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us. Oh, thanks to you and thanks to the Fox Foundation. Yeah, thank Great. you. Great. So, um, so.